I just want to make sure that uh, you get the idea right before you go into the test series. So let me finish the orientation. What we are essentially do here, as you can clearly see the word, it is an orientation just to give you the boundaries and borders so that you work within the limits. So that will be the objective. So before I start with uh, the expected, uh, you know, the orientation for this specific test, just want to start with what exactly is there for the remaining geography test series. So if you look at geography's uh, syllabus split up, it has been split into three tests. It is not just one test. Like today's orientation is only the first part. Okay. Physical geography, and that is what I'll be giving orientation to. But please understand, apart from physical geography, you have a separate test for Indian geography. And after Indian geography, you have one more segment. And it, it's, you know, the, the segment will actually state miscellaneous, miscellaneous topics. And in these miscellaneous topics, you have India map questions and agriculture questions. So I want you to know that we have an internal split for the test series. And I will be dealing, that is today's orientation, will be specifically for physical geography alone. So I just want to make that very clear. Uh, because usually, if you look at the last uh, five or six years trend, there is very good importance given to two parameters. First is your map and second is your Indian geography. And uh, physical geography, if you look at the percentage, if you take 10 questions, it's like uh, 33 to maybe possibly three to four questions you get from physical geography. So I just want you to know before we start that you will be having another orientation for the remaining two tests when the subsequent tests occur. So this is our limitation first for today. So our discussion will be restricted or limited to only physical geography. So within our physical geography syllabus, what are the broad divisions we have right here? The first one is your yeah, origin of the universe. Second broad classification is your geomorphology. Third is your climatology and fourth is your oceans. If you are to split up and then allot time, this is how you are going to do it. Now within this, how is UPSC asking questions or how has UPSC changed? That is what we need to understand uh, before we explore individual domains as origin of the universe, geomorphology or oceans or oceans or climate. Point to be appreciated is that even though you have four broad divisions, not all of them have equal importance when it comes to prelims. Okay, in general studies, Paper 1 means you would know that geography has the lion's share. You get 8 to 9 questions out of 20. But when it comes to the prelims perspective, you do understand that uh, apart from physical geography, you have several other domains in which questions can be asked. Fine. So for dealing with that, I just wanted to take you to the next slide. Okay. Yeah. And uh, that is regarding the trend. And based on the trend, we'll be able to draw the boundaries properly. First of all, I'm going to deal with questions or let's just say the topics which is primarily from 2015. Why 2015? Because 2015, you know that one significant change which is made in the exam pattern. The significant change is that CSA becomes a qualifying paper right now. Okay, it is not a scoring paper. Okay, and in the year 2013, if you all know, that is when your Indian forestry examination is first getting integrated properly. Now, what is the importance of Indian forestry getting integrated into your civil service preparation? The point is, if you're going to test a candidate, for Indian Forest Service in prelims, and you say that I'm going to evaluate him over a series of 100 questions, naturally you would get more questions from environment. Before 2013, if you look at the 100 percentage split, there would be more preference given to modern India polity. I'm not stating that it is not continuing till today, but the point is environment has definitely got an edge since 2013. And uh, since environment has started, a good number of questions from geography has actually moved on to environment. Because the limitation which is actually set is, you know, there is a certain amount of bar. So that is the reason we are restricting ourselves to uh, questions or the trend which is from 2015. Because you move before 2013, the way civil service examination was conducted did not include forest service. And hence, you won't be getting a proper, that cannot be the right uh, sample, you know, for analyzing or restricting ourselves in the trend. And uh, talking about the total number of questions, again, not total number of questions from geography, total number of questions from physical geography in the last six years, including 2020 prelims, it is 13. Okay, 13 doesn't sound to be a very attractive number, but you do know the importance that uh, at the end of the day, it boils down to one or two questions getting it right. And what you learn as foundation for physical geography is very essential for both your agriculture and environment, whose importance has definitely increased in the last few years since 2013 happened. Fine. So within physical geography, we saw there were four broad domains. Of these, one can be quite confident. You just take the question paper and look at it for the last six years. Questions were mostly from climatology. 
you know, rather than using the word mostly from climatology, I can confidently use this word 90 to 95 percent of 13 questions. You have definitely got, I don't know, 11 to 12 questions close to climatology. You did not have even one question from geomorphology. There are no questions. Of course, in 2020, uh, you did have a question about uh, minor minerals. Okay, what are major minerals, minor minerals, finding the identity one. But that's not technically what we learn from your NCRT in Fundamentals of Physical Geography. That's one of an odd question. You take out geomorphology at the same time you take questions on evolution of the universe, origin of the universe. Not really much, okay, except for one question, which again can be said as a common sense question, rather than stating as a revolution of the universe. So climatology has the lion's share and you get one or two questions from oceans. Now, within this, if you look at the type of questions, the civil service exam has moved away from this type of question. They're not asking what, okay? It's not like they give you what exactly is this phenomenon, okay? What is a niche, A, B, C, D, you give the options. It is always more about why and how. If a phenomenon is present, what enables the phenomenon to be operative and why certain phenomena are present in that way? So any topic you're going to learn in physical geography, Okay, please make sure that you address why and how questions. Dumping content, learning a large amount of information without knowing why and how is not going to get you marks because that is the pattern which is expected. And finally, what should be the material you should restrict yourself to? Again, no surprises here. See, when I say this to others, you know, there is always this, uh, you know, this perception that we need to learn a lot. There has to be so much of uh, new information which needs to be taken up. We will be seeing questions from the last five and six years, and you yourself will know. Attending these questions will only require a basic amount of knowledge. The basic amount of knowledge can be obtained from two textbooks itself. I'll repeat again. Okay, there is no doubt again. If you're following these two material, that itself will be enough for your physical geography part. Okay, apart from this, maybe let's say uh, randomly there is this uh, polar vortex. Okay, or maybe they, they, they talk about ozone depletion in newspapers and they, then maybe regarding that you can uh, update as part of current affairs. But apart from that, your material can be restricted to class 11 fundamentals of physical geography. The second most important book for physical geography is this. You, every one of you know that. Certificates Physical and Human Geography. Certificate Physical and Human Geography. Go Ching Leon. You cannot prepare UPSC without this book. So if you have your class 11 NCRT, Fundamentals of Physical Geography, along with Go Ching Leon, your material is there. Nothing more. Okay. It's not that I'm making things up. There's really nothing more. You don't need to uh, become an expert. There is no, there, it's not necessary that you learn Majid Hussain. People ask me this question, should I learn geography of India of Majid Hussain? Well, if you're interested, you can definitely learn. From the exam perspective, especially physical geography perspective, it is not going to help. So these two books are there, then you're on track. There is no deviation or anything or whatsoever. So with that in mind, let's proceed to the next set and and this is how it goes like we'll be looking at this is the this is the method and the presentation which we're going to follow right now we will be looking at questions and uh, based on upsc questions what is the boundary should i be drawing to what limitations and how i should ap be approaching the topic so that itself will give you different segments of the syllabus once the different segments of the syllabus has been done, certain parts of the syllabus from which you may not have got questions in the last five or six years, those things also will try. So that's the drill. I believe I made it clear. So question, so based on the question, what are the related topics? And in these associated topics, what you should specifically look for? You draw those boundaries and you save time also. Ready? So we start with the first topic. Okay, so this question I think all of you would have known. So this is from the topic Earth Movements, uh, asked in year 2018. On 20, 2019, on 21st of June, the sun does not set below the horizon at Arctic Circle, does not set below the horizon at Antarctic Circle, shines vertically over at noon on the equator, shines vertically over at Tropic of Capricorn. Our intention is not to solve the question. Our intention is to look where they take material from. This is sixth standard NCRT, that's all. Well, sixth standard NCRT, why didn't I mention as source material? Because they told you Go Ching Leong, that's all. Go Ching Leong chapter 1 will clearly have information about rotation of the earth, revolution of the earth and all that. If you are learning that properly, then this is not any question to meddle with. Fine. So within these limits, within earth movements, how should you actually prepare or what is the limitation you should set for yourself? See, if I am going to ask you questions on earth movements, there are 4 to 5 fundamental parameters you need to work with. So with reference to rotation, what type of questions I can ask you? 
Okay, that's all. So based on rotation, what factors change? I give a very simple two statement question. I just say that, you know, that the, the time of day and night is changed by rotation. Okay, you just look at the statement, you just need to think whether it's true or false. Okay, what will happen? You can have an hypothetical, hypothetical question, you know, what will happen if rotation uh, ceases? Okay, you get, the, you get the very basic idea. So if you're going to take a revolution, the same questions can be asked. Okay, so it's not, you won't be getting statements like the earth is rotating, you know, the earth is revolving around the sun in an anti-clockwise direction. The earth is revolving around the sun in an elliptical manner. No, that won't be the questions which UPSC asks you. UPSC might ask you, if revolution is going to change from one direction to another direction, what is essentially going to happen? Fine. What causes seasons? Is it not? And if you are answering revolution, then the answer is not perfectly correct. Because seasons are caused not just because of revolution, but it is about revolution on an inclined axis. You get the idea? So again, what we are trying to insist here is, it is not about learning the factual parameters of rotation, revolution, what are the dimensions. It's about what change do they bring in. Okay, to understand change, always think from the negative perspective. So if I'm going to stop rotation, what parameters change? If I'm going to stop revolution, what parameters are going to change? Okay, so what is the order of seasons? Fine, only based on your revolution, you get these questions based on equinoxes and solstices. So what exactly is an equinox? What exactly is a solstice? Okay, it is from equinox and solstice. You take your summer solstice, that is your June 21st. That's how the question came from. UPSC hasn't gone anywhere. They just touch your six standard basics because that's what they expect when it comes to physical geography. Believe the meaning makes sense. Now, apart from this, let's say they want to make it slightly complicated. Fine, and UPSC has this method, you know. They give you one, two, three, four. Okay, arranging it in the order of four, three, one, two, Okay, four, two, three, one, and all that, ascending, descending. Well, you could ask me what ascending and descending questions you can actually have here. Well, I can play with time. I can give you four cities. Okay, and after giving four cities, I can ask you, okay, of these four cities, which of the cities will see sunlight first? Or arrange them in the chronological order, which sees sunlight first, and then first to last, or last to first. A simple question. Again, this is related to your rotation part. So you just need to know that Earth rotates from western side to eastern side. And based on the cities located in the western hemisphere or eastern hemisphere, you'll be in a position to understand how things are. Now, how else can I play with time? I can ask you regarding time difference. Okay, we know that, uh, you know, uh, India has a plus five and a half uh, time difference with the Greenwich Meridian time. You know, let me give you four cities and ask you, four cities or four countries, and ask you which country has the largest time difference. All you need to think about is from my Greenwich Standard Meridian or from London, you know, how far should I travel? Should I travel to the Western Hemisphere or Eastern Hemisphere? You get the answer. Beyond this possibility of asking questions, twists and turns is actually not there if you think about it. You get it? So if there is one more final part, it is your international date line. When you travel from western side to eastern side, eastern side to western side, is you, are you going to gain a day or are you going to gain time? That's the only question possible. Is it clear? You learn these basics, then Earth's movements is done. Again, always remember, it is about change. Okay, it's always about how, why. You keep these things in mind for every topic which we discuss. I don't want to consistently repeat it. You keep this in mind, that's the first segment, Earth's movements. Rotation, revolution, and axial tilt. Along with rotation and revolution, you have related topics of time and day. So proceeding further, next question. Very fundamental question. You, you can have uh, similar questions before 2015 also. Why, again as we saw, why are dewdrops, it's not what, why are dewdrops not formed on a cloudy night? Clouds absorb the radiation released from the Earth's surface. Clouds reflect back the Earth's radiation. The Earth's surface would have low temperature on cloudy nights. Clouds deflect the blowing wind to ground level. So all you need to know is the basics of greenhouse effect and how are clouds formed. That is all you need to know. You know the, you know the fundamentals. This is a basic question. And where do you find the answer? It is there in NCRT again. Fundamentals of physical geography, water in the atmosphere. They tell you about cloud formation and what factors are there. So if you are going to learn humidity and precipitation, what should be the limitations? Well, learn like this. Start with the types of humidity. Again, I'm not going to ask you what is the formula for absolute humidity A, B, C, D. No. That is not a UPSC question. Could be a BSC Joffe question or maybe you're apply, you know, appearing for net exam, you'll get questions like that. When I talk about types of humidity, think about which measurement is more efficient. 
okay, between absolute, between relative, between specific humidity, which measurement is more efficient and why is it efficient? Okay, for example, you take absolute humidity uh, versus uh, your specific humidity. Specific humidity is a much better form of measurement if you're going to really uh, go ahead with measuring. You know why? Because specific humidity has no unit. Okay, the, the unit comes into play. You take absolute humidity. Absolute humidity, the unit is this. Okay, you have your gram per centimeter cube. There is, no, there is nothing wrong with this unit centimeter cube. The only thing is that you have volume component. Okay, and whenever you have your volume component, then based on your temperature changes, based on your pressure changes, your calculations will be affected. That is why absolute humidity is not usually preferred for calculations. It's a simple why question. Why do we go for specific humidity? Specific humidity is gram per gram. Just mass by mass. Mass by mass, there is no unit. Temperature pressure variations are not going to affect your calculations. As simple as that. Right now, talking about dryness and latitudes. Okay, we are talking about relative humidity variation with reference to latitude. So you take four different pressure belts. Okay, when you move from equatorial low to you know subtropical high to subpolar low to polar high pressure belts, I can give you four pressure belts and then ask you, okay, where exactly is uh, you know where do you expect more relative humidity? Or within these four pressure belts, I can ask you which pressure belt is having low relative humidity and why exactly is that? Okay, you just need to understand where there is rainfall, where there is absence of rainfall, which is more of a humid environment, which is more, uh, more of an arid environment. Just the opposite between adiabatic expansion, you get in a low pressure area, you get cloud formation, and in a high pressure region, you get adiabatic compression. So here the water, you know, the, the, the air begins to heat up really, really well, which means its capacity to hold water vapor in the atmosphere really increases. So which means this will be an arid environment. This is a humid environment. So you take your relative humidity quite high in this region. You go to a high pressure belt like a desert environment, the relative humidity is quite low because the atmosphere has greater and greater capacity to hold water, such a simple area. But if you look at variations, several variations are possible. Right. So within this, it's not over there. You know, you can talk about different forms of precipitation and different types of precipitation. Okay, now we are not talking about uh, a condensation. We are not talking about you know evaporation again. Those basics I will deal with later. But we are talking about different forms and types of precipitation. So how is again how how is sleet different from hailstones? UPSC will not ask you what are the four different forms of precipitation. Everyone knows that rainfall, snowfall, sleet, and hailstones. But how exactly sleet and hailstones are different? It is through the so you take sleet. Sleet is uh, refrozen melt water. Okay, it's there is more, more and more stress on the process. Okay, and uh, let me just ask you a question: Which of the following forms of precipitation, or which of the following form of precipitation, happens under temperature inversion conditions? Temperature inversion conditions, you will get sleet. That is the only condition you can get sleet because you want your water to refreeze again. So let's you, you know you just create an environment where the air layer, which is very very close to surface, okay, is having a temperature of less than zero degrees Celsius, and above is having a temperature of greater than zero degrees Celsius. Okay, this is possible in frontal temperature inversion. And let's say there is an uh, ice crystal falling down. Now, when the ice crystal falls down, as temperature is greater than zero degrees, it will begin to melt, becomes water droplet. Now, when this water droplet begins to move down to an environment, to the, the lower part of the air mass, which is in proper contact with the surface. So where temperature is less than zero, it is going to refreeze again, refreezes. So you get these irregular ice pellets, right? So this is what is sleet. You take hailstones, hailstones will actually look the same way. They are not physically distinct. It's only through the process. So I ask you a question, why exactly or where exactly does it happen? You should be in a position to understand, okay, temperature and inversion should be sleet. It is not learning what won't help you out. Okay, this is one more layer. Fine. Now, apart from this, apart from this basics of precipitation, what else should you work on when you talk about water in the atmosphere? Well, certain basics which you learn from physics. You already know these things from your physics, you know, you've been associated with them for the long time. But whenever exam comes or, you, you know, you want to talk about the exam, you really don't revise that. The major reason is it's not well described in NCRT. You just skip that and go away. Basics like properties of water. Okay, under properties of water. Revise the basics, you know, talk about anomalous property. Why does water expand on freezing? Okay, lat and heat. 
what exactly is latent heat and when is latent heat applicable. Okay, and the differential heating of land and water. Okay, why do we have, or you can ask a very simple question. How does water take a long time to get heated? Or why does water take a long time to get heated compared to land? A very simple, uh, three reasons or four reasons and ask you A, one and two only, B, one and three only. A classic UPSC question. Because you have four to five reasons and not all of them are correct. Some can be incorrect also. You get the meaning? So, not this anomalous property, not this land and heat, not this differential heating. Also, super cool water. Okay, so what exactly is super cool water? And uh, where do you form them? And how is it essential uh, for understanding whether an atmospheric phenomenon? Beyond these, water in the atmosphere, humidity and precipitation, you don't have limits. You can just restrict yourself to this. Your physical geography will be done, okay, when it comes to water in the atmosphere. So that was set two based on the UPSC question. Moving further. So this is about insulation and heat budget, a very direct, you know, very uh, simple question. But you look at it, might think that it's from current events. It is not. In the context of which of the following do some scientists suggest the use of cirrus cloud thinning technique and the injection of sulfate aerosols into the stratosphere? So creating artificial rains in some regions, reducing the frequency and intensity of tropical cyclones, reducing the adverse effects of solar wind on the earth, reducing global warming. Okay, we are talking about global warming again. Again, we are dealing with greenhouse effects. Okay, so when you deal with these type of topics, okay, so... What exactly are the factors which deal with heat budget? Okay, we have spoken about uh, greenhouse effects earlier, but what factors affect heat budget? And when we say heat budget, you know, affecting factors, we're not restricting ourselves to general earth, but also within latitude. Okay, is it just about, uh, you know, the, the, the latitudinal factor or is it just about the, uh, the distance which has to be taken between different latitudes? Is it just about the amount of dust which you might have? Is it just about the cloud formation? Is it just about the rainfall? Several factors again. So which factors affect latitudinal heat budget? One, two, three, four, A, B, C, D. One and three only, one, two, three only, one, two, four and five. So simple question. What factors affect latitudinal heat budget? You'll be standing, you know, staring right there in your NCRT, but... We don't usually recognize it. Reason is, you, you, given at least one attempt in civil services, you become too confident. These are way too fundamental for me to revise again. Why should I exactly do it? But that's all you need to do for physical geography. You need not go beyond NCOT. Don't start chasing compilations. You take a very simple concept, albedo. Okay, so albedo you know is the amount of radiation reflected from the surface. What question can I ask you? I can ask you four different ecosystems. That's all. I'll give you four ecosystems. For example, let's say rainforest. Let's take deserts. Let's take uh, glacier. Okay, maybe I'll take city. Okay, city, yes, a very, very small urban environment. So between all four of them, which is going to have a higher albedo, which is going to have a lower albedo. Again, arrangement. High to low albedo, low to high albedo. What does questions can come? Or I can ask you this question. Why do clouds have very high albedo? Okay, that's again a why question, interpretation. Beyond this, you cannot have questions from these. It's as simple as that. Directly there in your NCRT under the topic heat budget itself. Okay, how heat is actually present in the atmosphere. Just work on this, work on how things vary between different ecosystems. Okay, why are glaciers important? It can be a question like this again. Okay, they might ask you a question why we should be concerned about, you know, conserving our cryosphere. Okay, because cryosphere plays an important role. Fresh snow has one of the highest albedo in the world. It's more than 0.9, which means if 100 units of light is incident on your glaciers, more than 90 units is ref just reflected outside. So it is important for conservation. So there albedo comes into picture. Something very fundamental. Okay, so please don't skip something which is already there. It's right there on our face, but we neglect it because we feel you're very comfortable. That's why. Let's talk about this question, natural vegetation. And what limits can you put onto, onto yourself when you learn this topic? Which of the following leaf modifications occurs in desert areas to inhibit what laws? Hardened waxy leaves, yes, you have hardened wa waxy leaves and it enables you to, you know, reflect a good amount of radiation. Tiny leaves, yes, you want to reduce transpiration. Thorns instead of leaves, reduce transpiration again. Answer is all the above, one, two and three. No problem. So how exactly should you prepare? See, if I am going to generate a question, there are only two ways I can, I can ask questions in these. Only two ways. First is this. As you saw right there, there are different climatic regions, right? And each and every climatic region will have one specific type of forest. For example, let's take Mediterranean climate. 
ओके इन मेडिटेरियन क्लाइमेट यू हैव स्लीरोफिल स्लीरोफिल फॉरेस्ट सो स्लीरोफिल लैंडस्केप इज अ लैंडस्केप व्हिच इज डोमिनेटेड बाय श्रब्स राइट डोमिनेटेड बाय श्रब्स सो बेसिक क्वेश्चन व्हाई डू वी हैव स्लीरोफिल फॉरेस्ट इन मेडिटेरियन क्लाइमेट सिंपल मेडिटेरियन क्लाइमेट हैज अ ड्राई समर ओके यू आर नॉट गोइंग टू एक्सपीरियंस गुड अमाउंट ऑफ रेनफॉल सो सिंस यू हैव अ ड्राई समर plants should make up for an adaptation which will enable them to tide over the dry condition that is why they go for a shrub based structure the basic difference between a shrub and a tree as all of you know shrubs branch very close to the surface you take take a tree trees will branch only after going to a certain height now once you take a shrub based type of adaptation you're going to enclose the entire area which means the amount of surface area which is exposed to sunlight is very very less so you take your sunlight okay your sun is going to be active mostly on the outer surface right so the inner surface is actually prevented from the intense heat of the sun so that is one way of tiding over your dry summer you just you just wait for the winter rainfall meaning makes sense so if i'm going to ask you adaptations for natural vegetation totally you got only 11 climatic regions why are coniferous forests or why are coniferous trees shaped like a cone because they want to they do not want to avoid or they do not want accumulation of snow or their branches that is by the conical shape why exactly are they evergreen because a deciduous adaptation in a siberian climate is extremely costly okay you can go for a deciduous adaptation provided in your summer season you get good amount of rainfall that is why in british climate you get deciduous deciduous forest areas okay the reason is you have more moderation your coastal climatic region which means there is good amount of temperature your winter is not very severe you move far and far inland into siberia the winters become very severe and it's not possible for the trees to shed their leaves and then regrow them again okay the, the, the shedding leaves and regrowth is an extremely complex process you don't have that right so 11 climatic regions learn the adaptations you cannot get questions beyond this now what else can i ask you i can ask you only one more question species that's all that's all this you know the reason why people neglect this is only because people are lazy not that they cannot learn every climatic region is going to get possibly four species five species you know something which will define them find for example you take ebony or rose but you know that it's present it's going to be present in equatorial climate fine but you need to make sure you mention there is there is key species okay the keystone species the defining species for every climatic region okay just learn four for every climatic region use some mnemonics use some memory techniques beyond this it is not possible to frame questions okay what question do you expect upsc to ask your favorite tree they won't ask that they don't care it's that simple is it clear so keep you know keep your limitations with this then you're on spot fine proceeding further the next is set yeah so regarding evolution of the earth so this is more of a common sense question you know that is why even i was thinking twice should we put the word evolution but it's related to that consider the following statements the earth's magnetic field is reversed every few thousand few hundred thousand years so next one when the earth was created more than 4000 million years ago there was 50 per 54% oxygen and no carbon dioxide when living organisms originated they modified the early atmosphere of the earth if you have learned upsc or you prepared for civil service examination with the basics you would simply know that this is total nonsense carbon is one of the most abundant elements in the universe okay you cannot have an environment where there is no carbon dioxide so when you say that there is it doesn't matter 4000 million years or 3500 carbon was always there okay including today it's one of the most abundant elements in the universe the second statement is wrong you just take b out you just take d out so between 1 and 3 1 becomes automatically correct when living organisms originated they modified the early atmosphere of the earth yes it is true okay that's what plants did right we all know that and uh, that is after the uh, evolution of your cyanobacteria fine so that's what i told you it's a basic common sense question you not you need not learn for this uh, you might be thinking well i'm not aware of statement 3 it is there in your ncert again fundamentals of physical geography look at origin of the universe how the earth's atmosphere evolved okay how oxygen gets flooded in the hydrosphere and then moves to the atmosphere it's just right there all you need to look is just look closer at the ncert so closer to evolution of the earth you have only two possible areas of questions Okay the first is already there early atmosphere okay so when exactly so how did the cooling process start cooling process started outside in the outer the outer part of the earth became what we stand today as today's crust the inner part of the earth is still hotter right so once the outer part of the earth cooled fine did you had the most a uh, primordial most primordial earth's atmosphere you cannot call it as the right earth's 
first atmosphere. So cooling produces a very, very thin blanket, right? And then you would know, again, there in the NCRT, the process called degassing, where due to several severe volcanic eruptions over thousands of years, you have gases releasing from the interior of the Earth, right? So one of the important gases was carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and water vapor. Now, only then we come back to the same question again. We just saw it in the previous slide. Carbon dioxide is getting reduced in concentration after evolution of life. I'm talking about plants. So when carbon dioxide concentration decreased, plants started using carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, and then they started releasing oxygen, right? So that is why today's composition is largely dominated by nitrogen and oxygen. Okay, you have a 98, 99% is simply because of these two elements in the atmosphere. But early atmosphere were modified. So this basics would be enough. Now, apart from this, there is only one why question. Why does nitrogen have the highest composition in atmosphere? Uh, we know that carbon dioxide got affected, water vapor got affected. In after point of time, it was mostly water vapor. After there was rainfall, you know, the entire water vapor in the atmosphere started flooding the oceans. So why exactly is it nitrogen? That's one possible question. Simple. The answer is inert. That's it. Compared to the other sister elements, you compare the other elements which you have in nature, nitrogen is much more inert. So when all the other elements are more active, when all the other elements are trying to interact with, you know, as many components as possible, if you're going to stay inert, people might get into the system, people might leave the system, but you will always be there. That is why nitrogen's composition is very, very high. It continues to do so. So that is your basic question. Questions which are vaguely possible in Earth's atmosphere, the Earth's early atmosphere. You cannot get why and how questions beyond this, right? And talking about the next point, you know, your, yeah, let's talk about the Earth's crust. So when you talk about the Earth's crust, again, directly from NCRT, you have a chapter, uh, interior of the Earth. So you talk about Earth's interior, right? So if I'm going to ask you a question, I can ask you like three different segments are there. You have the crust, then you have the mantle, then you have the core. Fine. Think about why questions again. Why is the inner core solid? Okay, why is the outer core liquid? Right, why is mantle solid? Okay, how is it able to maintain its stability? All of them are why and how questions. You want a factual question? Only two to three possibilities. I can give you crust, mantle, core. Okay, and these three things, arrange them in the increasing order of volume or decreasing order of volume or arrange them in the increasing order of surface area. I'm talking about this one, the depth value. Okay, increasing order of surface area, decreasing order of surface area. Where is the presence of a specific metal? Okay, you take iron between crust, mantle and core. Where is it actually going to be dominant? Without that, you don't have questions from the interior, the why and how questions. Right. You come to the crust very close, you know that you have the asthenosphere. So why exactly do we have an asthenosphere? Again, a why question. Okay, draw your boundaries and limits. I know that you're very familiar with your factual part. It's more about the why. Why exactly? Why is the outer crust liquid, inner crust solid? Why do we have the asthenosphere on top? Why don't we have it at the bottom? Okay, why do we have more magnetic material or more ferromagnetic substances in the center? What is the role of uranium in the Earth's interior? These are the factors which you will need to learn. NCRT mostly gives you what? It does that. It does that really, really well. And yes, good amount of why and how also. But instead of trying to explore within NCRT, you might have the tendency to read more and more books. Okay, because you are concerned, you're concerned about leaving things out, concerned about left out, right? That's what happens. People are concerned that they might be left out of preparation. If someone else who's near you, possibly your roommate, okay, they are the major problems in our preparation, tells you that there is a very good book and it gives you everything. That's when you make errors. No, it is not required. Restrict your material, keep the same material and think what possible questions. Meaning makes sense. So proceeding further to the next set right now, so this is a direct question from Coral Reeves, and you're preparing for UPSC, you can't miss this. Consider the following statements. Most of the world's coral leaves are in tropical waters. More than one third of the world's coral leaves are located in territories of Australia, Indonesia, Philippines. Coral reefs host, host far more number of animal phyla than those hosted by tropical rainforests. All these are straightforward, correct statements. The answer is one, two, and three, right? So if you're going to take the topic of coral reefs, how exactly should you work? What possible questions I can ask you? See, you look at the question, the question itself tells you a certain parameter. See, it's not just for this. Like any organism, you're working for environment also, keep two to three things in mind. Generally, let's say there is, let's say Himalayan brown bear, snow leopard, a great Indian bustard, anything comes up to your mind, 
we'll, we'll deal with coral reefs again, but before that, you see anything in news, UPSC can ask only three questions. Right, let's take an animal. First of all, where is it distributed? Is it in India or is it only in Nigeria? Or is it in the northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere and all that? Simple question. UPSC can ask you. Number two, what else can I ask you? Now, after asking you about the distribution, where exactly does it live? Is it in a rainforest? Is it present in a deciduous forest? Is it a part of a grassland ecosystem? Is it part of a desert? Fine, apart from this, it is a third type of question, which is quite rare, but still, we will keep ourselves in the race. If possible, look at the conservation status. Are we talking about endangered, critically endangered, vulnerable? More importance is to be provided for critically endangered and endangered. Those two things would do. You learn these three things alone for any animal, okay, which, come, which you come across in news, that would be enough. It is not necessary that during, in, you know, in a single pregnancy, how many cubs will this lion give? That is not required. What is the uh, width of this, you know, what is the, what is the, how, 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 you know, how heavy is it, okay, or how fat can it grow? Not required for the exam. Just learn these things alone. You look at coral reefs, you get a pretty, pretty similar idea. They talk about higher biodiversity, where exactly it is located. Okay, it's about distribution, both the first and second statements. That's all they expect from you. You don't need to be a magician to score, right? So now coming back to coral reefs again. So in coral reefs, if there is going to be any specifics, what exactly should you know? Some basics again. So look at limitations. I've spoken in detail about distribution, right? So when we talk about characteristics, okay, where do they grow? Where do they grow and why? Because Goching Leong, Goching Leong, I have a description of coral reefs, right? So if they tell you shallow waters, yeah, why exactly shallow waters? Okay, why not deep waters? Well, deep waters, you do not have good amount of sunlight. Without good amount of sunlight, it is very difficult to photosynthesize, not constructive for formation of your coral reefs, extensive structures. As simple as that, you know, deep waters are at the same time problematic because in deep waters there is more carbonic acid because there is more and more carbon dioxide dissolution due to increase in pressure and carbonic acid can slowly corrode calcium carbonate so slowly the coral reef is going to dissolve over a period of time in deep waters it's very dangerous that is the reason i told you look for several reasons because if i'm going to frame a question what are the reasons or what are the factors you have coral reefs only in shallow waters one two three four so which is more appropriate? So you stick yourself with one reason, singular, may not be really helpful because UPSC tries to club things, especially 2020 prelims, if you've seen, you get very, UPSC changes between two to three years, of course, but this year, the, the, the number of statements were very high. At the same time, the size of the statements also was quite high. So I can club three to four reasons together and then give it to you, right? Now, apart from these, just know as an information, you have a certain type of coral reefs. Okay, you can, uh, those are deep water corals. This is not something which conventionally occurs in your news. Deep water corals. Deep water corals can exist in depths of close to two kilometers from the surface level at temperatures of even four degrees Celsius. You're talking about very, very cold environments, uh, very uh, deep environments below sea level. Okay, so this is different, it's slightly off from your conventional uh, coral reefs. So this is something you can try to work on. Okay, this is provided because this is off track and UPSC likes off track, something unconventional, right? So beyond this, your questions are limited. Basic question, you know, why don't we have large amount of coral reefs on the western side of continents? You know, because on the western side of continents, you find cold ocean currents and cold ocean currents are detrimental to coral reefs. A simple why question. So you learn about coral reefs, look for whys, try to club with reasons and characteristics. Your work is done. It's as simple as that. Fine. I hope you don't so. Moving further, next would be, yeah, wind system. Something which you can never learn climate without. Sorry. So consider the following statements. The winds which blow would be in 30 degree north and 60 degree south latitudes throughout the year are known as westerlies. The moist air masses that cause winter rains in northwestern region of India are part of westerlies. That's your western disturbance. So which of the following statements given above are correct? Right, so for this, all you need to do is go back to your tricellular meridional circulation, nothing else. Okay, so when you prepare, please start from the basics again. Because if there is going to be any physics touch or science touch, we don't, don't want to miss anything. Again, just an update. I think you're familiar. 
Like between science and technology, in the last few years, UPSC has moved more towards the technology part rather than basic science. You take seven years earlier, it would have been more science, but still, we don't want to take any chances. So start with the types of forces which influence winds, starting from your frictional force, your Coriolis force, okay, your pressure gradient force, PGF, pressure gradient force. These are the three basic forces. It's right there in NCRT, you would just skip it. Not required because you're a senior. It happens, right? You just learned it once, twice, thrice. You feel very confident. You're like, ah, not really required. Please pay attention. Okay, what are isobars? What are uh, geostrophic winds? Right? So someone poses you this question. You address this question, what and then, why do geostrophic winds flow in higher altitudes? Why are they not very close to the surface? Simple question, but yes. Geostrophic winds are balanced only by pressure gradient force and frictional force. If they flow closer to the, sorry, pressure gradient force and Coriolis force. If geostrophic winds flow close to the surface, frictional force becomes a dominant factor. And you cannot have a geostrophic wind, so close to impossible. That is why they are found, right? Once you've got the fundamentals right, then of course you can never miss the circulation system. Your tricellular meridional circulation and the formation of pressure belts and the different wind systems, starting from your trade winds, your westerlies and polar easterlies, right? Now something which you can overlook right here, it's an off topic, but still, please work on this one. Okay, because uh, people still have a confusion on what factors can still be influenced by Coriolis force. You know, later, eight months into preparation, one and a half years into preparation, people ask, okay, does Coriolis force really influence ocean currents or not? The answer is yes. Any entity which is going to travel hundreds and thousands of kilometers will be influenced by Coriolis force because the earth is rotating. And Coriolis force is simply an outcome of rotation. So what exactly are rotated, you know, affected by Coriolis force? What about a missile? Yes, it is affected. Missile travels a long distance in a short span of time, right? Okay, not a cricket ball. Cricket ball is way too short. The time duration is very, very less. The space pattern is very, very less. So please be careful. So what does it affect? So one, two, three, four. And this time, when you connect these points, just make sure that you're able to connect with different streams because UPSC can club things together again. They have the habit of doing that. Local winds. Now, I'm not talking about your mountain breeze your valley breeze or your land breeze and sea breeze. Those are periodic local winds, of course, which happen every single day. They're diurnal winds. Diurnal. And this goes in relation with your differential heating of land and water, differential heating of your mountain and valley. There is no chance you will get confused. But apart from this, you have seasonal winds in different parts of the world. And seasonal winds can be a simple match the following question. And I can give you uh, a list of winds, one, two, three, four, and ask you to match with the country. So wind name, name of the wind, and ask you the country, that's it. Or the continent, even the continent would be fine. You get it? So beyond this, local winds restricted again. Not really a problem to explore. Okay, so that, keep these limitations on your wind system. If this segment is done, and of course, the most important wind system, which frequently makes news, more important for your mains perspective, but still, don't forget these. Okay, something which you have not understood clearly, but influences both climate and weather patterns really, really well. Okay, why factors? Why are jet streams located only in two pressure belts? Why only over subtropical high? Why only over subpolar low pressure belts? Because those are the only two regions where the temperature difference between two different, uh, you know, two different air masses or temperature difference between two different areas are very, very high. And that is where you get a perfect balance, or should I say a good balance, between pressure gradient and Coriolis force. Because jet streams are, after all, geostrophic winds. You take jet streams, of course, like Indian geography you'll need to learn specially, but since it's world geography, world physical geography, you can restrict yourself to the global jet streams again. When you learn Indian geography, you will learn how jet streams try to bring western disturbances to northwestern in India, at the same time how easterly jet stream is important during the southwestern monsoon period. So if this homework is done, then beyond this, you, you really cannot ask questions. So that was a, look at the previous question, I think you remember, westerly is operating between this and this latitude. It's a very simple question. So that is your limitation for this. Need not worry beyond that. So keep, the, keep this in mind for wind system. It's more about the basics. Next is cyclones. In the South Atlantic and Southeastern Pacific regions and tropical latitudes, cyclones does not originate. What is the reason? Well, the answer is this, right? ITC it really occurs. Is it not? So when it comes to cyclones, you take this year also. This year there was a question, uh, 2000, yeah, this prelims. Okay, they talked about the eye of the cyclone. 
there was one question relating both jet stream and cyclone. And in the eye of the cyclone, there was a question which said, uh, I don't exactly remember the statement, but it was about uh, temperature and pressure again. You know, it's, it's, the eye has very high temperature and very, very low pressure. You know that fundamentally, then you'll be in a position to answer that question. Now, what should be the limitation? How should you work on this? Well, if you're going to learn cyclones, focus first on your distribution. Like, where does it occur? Conditions of formation. Okay, because conditions will give you why and how questions. That is why. Okay, why tropical cyclones form only over water? Or, or why do they form only over sea? Simple question. Right? The reason is, tropical cyclones are essentially heat engines. Okay, they need enormous amount of latent heat. Only then they can survive. That is the reason they form only over water. So you look at conditions. Why only shallow waters? Shallow waters, you have a very, very less number of layers to be heated. So it's much easier to heat up the entire body. Okay, not over deep waters. But of course, tropical cyclones can move over deep waters. So you look at conditions for formation. And again, you ask why questions are questions. Why exactly this condition? Why do they stress on upper air divergence? What do you mean by vertical wind shear? Okay, what will happen if there is more vertical wind shear? Basics, it's there exactly. Everything is there in the NCR. You take wind shear. Okay, so wind shear is simply with increase in altitude. So with increase in altitude, how does my wind velocity vary? It can either vary like this, this is one condition, or it can vary like this. Right? So between these two conditions, this is very good for formation of cyclone. Because the cyclone will be able to maintain its position. Okay, you, you get huge cumulonimbus clouds, the adiabatic expansion, and your uh, compression in the center goes hand in hand to form the eye. You get very high vertical wind shear. The cyclone will collapse. That's it. Okay, if a cyclone, if air begins to rise and cloud formation takes place, everything is blown away. So high vertical wind shear is not advisable. Why? Structure of cyclone is destroyed. Low vertical wind shear will keep your cyclone very, very intact. Again, why question? That's it. So any conditions you come across, any conditions you come across, please be careful. Just ask this question, why? Why exactly does it happen? So high vertical wind shear is detrimental because it destroys low vertical wind shear enables. Why? Not just for your tropical cyclones, same for temperate cyclones also. Okay, why only certain frontogenesis phenomenon evolve into temperate cyclones? Why not all frontogenesis? Something very, very fundamental, right? Now, let's talk about one more parameter. Statement question. Okay. And these statement questions usually occur as differences. Like tropical cyclones are smaller, temperate cyclones are larger. So two, three, four. Four statements I can ask you, then ask you to compare which of the following statements given above are correct or incorrect. Very, very simple and fundamental. Right? So you know the conditions, you know the differences between tropical and temperate. Beyond that, you need not actually work. Okay, what else can I ask you? I can give you, like if I'm going to try to frame an innovative question, I can give you four regions. And after giving you four regions, I can ask you, okay, in these four regions, for example, four different seas, which sea, which water body has more probability or more frequency of cyclones? Why does Bay of Bengal have more cyclones compared to Arabian Sea? A simple question, right? So those questions can actually occur. And the last part, always remember this, what are the inhibiting factors? Inhibition. Right. So you take inhibition of tropical cyclones. Tropical cyclones do not form near the equator because at the equator there is no Coriolis force. Without Coriolis force, there is no rotation at all. Something like that. You take temperate cyclones, you need the help of jet streams. You know, jet streams uh, through meandering movements in the upper atmosphere can actually enable, sorry, can actually disable or enable the formation of cyclonic systems or disable the formation of cyclonic systems. So this is for temperate cyclones, which jet streams can do. So please be careful about why certain factors help in formation, why certain factors inhibit formation also. That is where ITC said comes into picture, this 2015 question, right? Okay, so one of the in enabling factors is uh, intertropical conversion zone because ITC said has this vertical structure okay, where air begins to rise, and you take a low pressure system, which is a cyclone, both of them have the same structure, 
Okay, so wherever ITCZ moves over, ITCZ has very good chance, very good opportunity of producing cyclones because both ITCZ and cyclone are low pressure regions. It's as simple as that. Okay, so you take your South Atlantic and Southeastern Pacific, you don't have ITCZ, meaning the ITCZ doesn't really shift further. Why again? Because Southern Hemisphere is mostly made of water. Water takes more time to get heated compared to land. That is why your ITCZ doesn't shift really well in the Southern Hemisphere. So ITCZ rarely occurs, so you don't get many cyclones in South Atlantic and Southeastern Pacific. It's just a fundamental application of only two things, differential heating of land and water parameter. Second, a simple understanding that ITCZ is nothing but a low pressure system. You get these, then you're on spot. That's why I told you stick to NCRT, stick to the basics. Do not really strain. Uh, this is the traditional UPSC question. Last five years, we haven't seen this. Okay, Every day is more or less the same. That's all. It's over. There is, there is no, no strain. Why waste time in reading the remaining parts? The statement is fine. Okay. So if I'm going to ask you a question on climatic regions, what am I going to ask you? Well, simple. There will be a defining feature of a climatic region. To understand the defining feature, that is where you need the Goching Leong part. So in your Goching Leong, when you work, please work on these parameters alone. Okay. Just a second. Your climograph. Every climatic region which you come across will have a climograph indicating two parameters. On the x-axis, you will have the month starting from January to December. In the y-axis, there will be two information. One information will be rainfall, right? And the second information will be temperature. Both will be provided. So rainfall is represented by this bar chart. And then your, uh, you know, your, your temperature is represented by a line, right? You get a line indicating so January, uh, you know, April, uh, December, and all that they would have connected and created a line. So when you work for your climatic regions, focus on the climograph. There are totally 11 climatic regions. What is the defining feature? So you take Savannah or Sudan. How was Savannah or Sudan different from Steppe? Okay, look at the climograph of a hot desert. Look at the climograph of a cold desert. What defines a hot desert? What defines a cold desert? Because if I ask you the question, I will ask you only the unique feature. I want you to differentiate one climatic region from the other so you know the unique feature, you will be in a position to properly apply. So restrict yourself to your climograph for questions on climatic regions. Why? Because natural vegetation you've already learned. When did you learn? I think uh, 30 minutes back. We just saw natural vegetation, right? So under natural vegetation, what are the adaptations? What species? You know that the climograph, that's all your work is done. So that's what, again, I told you, basic variations. So basic variations meaning you take China climate, for example. Uh, in China climate, that is your warm, temperate, eastern margin climate, you'll have three climographs, not one. So it is actually going to have three basic variations. Fine, you have something in China as a representative. You have a subtype in North America known as Gulf type. You have a subtype in South Africa also called as Natal type. You go to Laurentian climate. Laurentian climate is found only in the northern hemisphere, but again, Laurentian climate has one Asia type and it has only more America type. So these are basic subset variations. So this also you can graph three climographs. So just be careful, right? Proceeding further. Yeah, now we are turning oceans. So far it has never made an appearance. Okay, I think this is the last question after that we have subjects alone. Tides occur in the oceans and seas due to which among the following? Gravitational force of the sun, gravitational force of the moon, centrifugal force of the earth, all the above. Right, so something very fundamental. So if I'm going to ask you questions on tides, what are the related topics? What should you actually learn on? Well, work like this. All these three are subtopics. Okay, subtopics under what? Movement. Right? So you take your waves in general, waves you are essentially talking about horizontal transmission of energy. Okay, You take your currents, currents is a result of transmission or movement of water due to temperature and salinity variations. You take your tides, tides is essentially vertical movement of water caused due to gravitational force, something very fundamental. Now within this, you need to work with this basic parameter. For example, like why do they change? What caused them? What causes them? 
where are they where are they restrict your preparation to only these these three questions you will be in a you know you will be in a position to properly address whatever questions come for example let's take uh, one sample let's take tides you know let's take yeah let, we've just seen tides so we'll take currents for example because currents is a larger subset right so let's start from the first one so what causes them so we just addressed you can have temperature variations uh, you can have uh, uh, salinity variations okay density variations and that's what causes your ocean currents but basically it's about temperature okay because you are going to learn or what you primarily learn as part of your ncrt between your surface ocean currents and deep ocean currents is 90% of your you know what even though only 10% of water volume is transported by surface currents you learn only surface currents deep currents is a subject for the optional students okay so what essentially causes them temperature variations you have the warm current and the cold current okay so why do they change you know why do they change meaning why does one ocean current change to the other for example you take your north atlantic ocean okay let's take your north america south america africa okay then you have europe when you have the equatorial currents moving from the eastern side to western side then you have your gulf stream okay then the gulf stream becomes north atlantic drift then it returns as canary current you know that this is one particular guy now you ask questions you know why do they change why exactly does my equatorial current flow from eastern side to western side well because of trade winds you got your answer because surface currents are technically wind driven again why exactly is my gulf stream very very hot because it is moving from equator to polar region why is it returning back because it is losing large amount of energy so it return back as a cold current so that completes one circulation gyre so why is my warm current more powerful than a cold current because of higher temperature and energy they are able to move how do they influence your local weather patterns again a how question okay so you are talking about the change phenomenon so same can be applied for waves you just take this change question and apply to waves why do waves you know change from uh, having very very a uh, longer wavelength to shorter wavelength once they approach the shoreline a very simple question okay, which is your wave shoaling which is very dangerous during tsunamis so restrict to the third question again you know, where are they okay where are they meaning i give you the name of an ocean current okay let's say we say benguela current where exactly is benguela current south atlantic south pacific south indian or north atlantic you should be in a position to properly pinpoint fine let's take tides for example where do uh, or where is uh, tidal range very very high okay let's say four different regions or four different areas where do you expect to have very very high tides meaning makes sense so apart from this if i can ask you something which is out of the box it is only with reference to this i cannot tell you the way they can frame a question but they can ask you it's a possibility okay since unconventional possibilities of power generation now this is a mains question this is definitely a mains question i don't deny that at all that is power generation from tides power generation from currents power generation from waves okay but i can ask you as a two step on feasibility like is it feasible in this region or i can ask you problems basic idea which of the following are problems of tidal power energy or tidal tidal energy generation 1 2 3 okay destroying ecosystems you know actually impeding natural flow of transport and all that 1 2 3 can give you a 1 and 3 only 2 and 3 only this is more of an out of the box question it it should become more appli application oriented and of course it can be more of a science and technology question or an environment question but still it's something you can work okay so restrict yourself with these three questions why do they change what causes them where exactly are they okay your preparation at least for the the small ocean part is done fine moving further yeah i think that was the last question so we have certain segments alone let me just show you like what is are we looking at because the that the list which i showed you first is based on the questions asked in 2019 to 15 so apart from this there are certain other topics which is part of the test syllabus okay just want to show you how many more are there so we have climatology oceans geo so these three are the divisions and what exactly has in fallen under so far in our discussion see under climate the fundamental foundation part this is chapter 8 in fundamentals of physical geography right just know the basics of temperature decline like in troposphere with increase in latitude altitude what happens to temperature does it increase does it decrease and all that okay which uh, sphere in the atmosphere is actually having larger thickness which is thinner which is thicker right 
It's, it's always the basics which you tend to, tend to miss. Fine. Now, when we deal with temperature, what are the factors which affect temperature? Okay, this can be an application-oriented question. Again, giving you four places, giving you four cities. Arrange them in order of increasing average temperature or decreasing average temperature. 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, 2, 3, 1. There you need to apply. Okay, is this climatic region closer to the sea? Is it far away? Is it closer to your equator, far away from equator? Is it present, to a, present near a cold ocean current, a warm ocean current? Several factors are there. So that's something which you do on spot. That is the most difficult question I can ask you in temperature. Apart from that, not much of an issue. And this is more of a physics question. Pressure, how does it change in different parts of the world? If you are learning this, I'm pretty sure you can link it with your wind system and learn. Pressure gradient force. Okay, that's the easier set. Relevant. Okay. Beyond this, your climate section is done. So we are, we are try, trying to limit ourselves, find the borders of physical geography. So that ends your climate part. One of the second one. Your oceans. So oceans again, we've dealt with the movement part. So more why and how questions can come from your tides, waves and ocean currents. Apart from this, these are more of static sections or reliefs of ocean basin. For example, where do I find trenches? Okay, do I find more trenches in convergent plate margins or do I find them more in divergent plate margins? Where are more sea mounts? Okay, where there is more volcanic activity? Okay, that is essentially a result of your, you know, the relief of ocean basin. Again, you're talking about locality right now, where, how, and why. Not just blunt reading of your uh, chapter in fundamentals of physical geography. Not going to help. Focus on this segment. Okay, and this one, temperature and salinity of the ocean. Two different ways you can learn. How does temperature of the ocean vary with the latitude? How does salinity of the ocean vary with latitude? How does temperature and salinity vary with depth? Okay. These two are the only possible questions. Beyond this, you cannot ask anything. You think there is one more? Yes, there is. It's there in Go Cheng Leong also. Again, ordering. You've seen this so many times. I've repeated at least four to five times, four to five different samples. Give you four different uh, ocean basins, four, four ocean basins or four seas. Ask you to arrange them in order of increasing salinity or decreasing salinity. No more possibilities. Okay, you can check any UPSC question, not a civil service exam. You take your CAPF, you take the, 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 the other examinations which are connected by civil service also. When it comes to certain topics like physical geography, okay, you take polity. Questions are exhausted. You can only have it within the limit. So you look at latitude variation, temperature variation with both latitude and depth, salinity variation, latitude and depth. What factors will affect your salinity and all that? Factors affecting salinity. Beyond that, it is done. It's over. Fine. The last part after factors affecting salinity, your geomorphology. As I told you, the topic hasn't received much attention from UPSC for the last five years, but still, we can expect bouncers, in swingers, yorkers from UPSC all the time. So, once you've finished the entire segment, what you've seen so far, please make sure you revise. Again, look at the word I'm using. I use the word revise because I assume you've already learned. Revise. The landform section. Okay. When I say landform section, I'm not asking you to study in detail. How does my glacier originate? How does my glacier erode? What methods of erosion are actually there? What is their method of transport? What is their method of deposition? No. For an erosional agent. Erosional agent. Okay. It can be glacier. It can be wind. It can be water. Okay, so for this erosional or, or any agent, what is my erosional landform? Erosional landform and then my deposition landform. If UPSC is going to revisit this topic, this will be top priority. Okay, because this, this is something which is repeated in other, not just your civil service, but other exams also, other exams connected to UPSC. So this is one type. Winds, erosion versus deposition landform and all that. Number two, basics of rocks. See, if, if, please don't ask me what do I do if UPSC asks this question, minerals, okay, they did, they did come up with the bouncer. Bouncer comes, it's too difficult to face, just leave the ball. Don't ask me what to do. Okay, that's better advice. Good ball, respect to just leave it. Rocks, you can definitely work. I'm talking about igneous, sedimentary and metamorphic rocks. It's a very small chapter, chapter 5. Chapter 5, very small chapter. Focus on the basics. Where is there more possibility of fossil formation, which is denser? 
of these three which will experience more changes due to temperature and pressure okay which is uh, you know dominant in continents which is more dominant in oceans so basic things are there the basics of your igneous metamorphic and sedimentary rocks if you are able to revisit that would be more than enough and finally i have already set it in oceans okay you can never uh, leave plate tectonics and go to exam okay even though plate tectonics again it's more of a main topic okay you can associate with mountain formation and volcano formation you can have this as more of the final closure part because the importance is less so try to finish your climate first okay because more number of questions then you can come to your climatic regions fundamentals of climate climatic regions then to your oceans it's again left to you you know to allocate time better you will know your strengths and weakness fine then finally maybe you can wrap up with this and what if what i believe have helped you is to draw the boundaries and keep it within limits try not to learn too much of books and too many materials it will only be counterproductive if on top of all these on top of all these you get anything in current affairs that's something you can work on right so that is my uh, discussion okay i hope you don't make errors in the topics which you've seen so far please don't do that my heart my heart will feel very sad take care and see you for the test bye